as we get into the message this morning, let me start by asking you a question, something for you to think about for a moment. And that question is, what things do you value most in this world? What things do you treasure in this world? Maybe it's several things, uh, but picture those things in your minds right now. And then ask yourselves, those things that you're picturing, how attached to those things are you? How devoted to them are you? The Israelites in Micah's day, well, they were attached to objects of their affection. They were attached to idols, things that they were worshiping in addition to or in place of the one true God. We know specifically from Scripture that the Israelites, well, they were idolizing wealth, sensual pleasures, power, comfort, and security. That is, they were pursuing these things at the expense of pursuing God. They were trusting in these things before they were trusting in God. These things had become more important to them than God himself. As a result, as we read last week in Micah chapter 1, the first nine verses, God was coming to judge the Israelites for their sin. God was coming to judge the Israelites for their idolatry. He was going to bring judgment down upon them, one, to break their idols, to tear them down, but also the power that these idols had over the people. And the reason why God had to go to such extremes, the reason why he had to exercise judgment, was precisely because the Israelites had become so attached to these idols in their lives. We as human beings form strong attachments with those things we idolize or worship. And when that worship is directed at God, that attachment is grand and glorious as we live in this tight, intimate relationship with the God who created us. But when we give our hearts over to things or people before God, then our attachment to those things results in greater sin. It results in injustice in our lives, just as it did in the Israelites in Micah's day. The reason why we are so attached to the idols in our lives is because idols have a way of capturing our hearts, of capturing our imaginations as we worship them. And the truth is, is that every single one of us in this room is influenced and shaped by outside sources. We should be influenced and shaped by the Word of God, the truth of Scripture. But far too often we allow our hearts to be captured and captivated by other objects or other people. As we go through Micah, it's appropriate for us to ask ourselves, what things do we idolize? What things do we place before God? Is it a person? Is it a romantic interest? A spouse? A child? A celebrity? Or maybe even yourself? Is it material gain and wealth? Is it personal comfort and security? Or is it sensual pleasures, entertainment, sports? What things have captivated your heart? at the expense of the time you should be spending in God's Word, studying it and reflecting upon it. In today's passage out of Micah chapter 1, Micah is going to help us to see how attached to their idols the Israelites had become. We're going to read from verse 10 down to the end of chapter 1 in verse 16. Beginning in verse 10. <coughs> Tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all. In Bethlehem, roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Za'anan do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Etzel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Marath wait anxiously for good. Because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. 
Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. For in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Aksib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marashah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. So what is going on here? Why is Micah giving us this list of towns here in chapter 1? Well, first of all, Micah is tracing the path of the coming Assyrian army. Part of God's judgment against the Israelites was that they would be carried out of their land. They would be carried off from Israel at the hands of the invading Assyrian army. Eventually, the Assyrians would end up overtaking Israel, and their king would come in and rule. He would go through these towns and take control, their king, King Sennacher. So this is the path of God's coming judgment. Second, and most importantly, Micah is showing that even though these cities have hopes, based upon their identity or location, those hopes will not come to fruition. In reference to each town mentioned, a disaster was going to take place. And each town was going to suffer a judgment related to the meaning of its name. And we're not going to run through every town, but we're going to look at verses 10 through 11, and you'll get the idea. You'll see the pattern here. In verse 10, Micah mentions Beth Laophra, which means house of dust. And Micah, Micah says to them basically there in verse 10, guess what? Soon in the near future, you're all going to be rolling around in dust yourselves. In verse 11, he mentions the town of Shafir. This town is translated as beauty town, a town of beauty. And Micah tells them, well, you may be known for your beauty, but now you are going to be known as you live in nakedness and shame. Then in verse 11, we read of Za'ana, which means going forth town. And what does Micah say to them? Don't go forth. It is better for you not to go forth. In fact, don't come out at all. Stay inside. And then in verse 11, the town of Beth Etzel. Its name means a house of taking away. But Micah tells them, your standing place, your prominence, your importance shall be taken away from you. That which protects you will be stripped from you. What Micah is doing here is he's using deliberate puns to describe the ironic nature of the coming destruction. The very thing that each of these towns was known for the very thing that each of these towns took pride in, which they idolized and worshipped, well, these would be the source of their destruction and the place where its judgment would be most clearly seen. And these puns run throughout this passage. And then in verse 15 we read, I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marashah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. The conqueror referred to here is King Sennacherib. And the word Marashah means both disposes and conqueror possessor. This town, known as being a conqueror, is about to be conquered and possessed by a foreign king. His invading army will dispose of the inhabitants of the land. And then we see the town of Adullam mentioned. And for those of you who are studious, you'll know that Adullam comes from the Bible earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 22. And this is the cave to which David ran to when he fled for his life from King Saul. So what Micah is saying here is that the Israelites, 
The judgment is going to be so severe, things are going to get so bad, that they are going to want to run and flee because of this coming judgment against their idolatry. But Micah is telling them, there's no place for you to go. There is no cave for you to hide in. There is no place where you can rest. There's no place where you can hide from the coming judgment of the Lord. The indictment and judgment that is coming upon them is then laid out in verse 16. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle for they shall go from you into exile. When Micah talks about making yourselves bald and cutting off your hair, it's a reference to the shame that will come upon the people. As they, including their children, will be carried off into exile as slaves. You see, the Israelites have been enslaved to their sin. They have been enslaved to these idols that they worship. And now God, through Micah, is telling them, you're about to experience a different kind of slavery. As you live in slavery to the brutal Assyrians. The idols that the Israelites had bowed down to had affected and shaped them and the way in which they lived. It led them to perpetrate great injustices at the expense of others. And likewise, the idols that we worship today undergird, undergird and lie at the foundation of the injustices that exist within our own societies. It's fascinating that these things that th these towns took pride in would be the source of their destruction. And it makes me think, what is this community known for? What things does Ann Arbor take pride in? What things do they value here? And you don't have to be here long, but before you realize that the university has a huge shadow over this community. And there's a lot of, I don't want to say arrogance, but maybe pride that is evident in some people in this community. I've had a, a nice person, actually two different people, one from this church, one from outside of this church, that told me uh, Ann Arbor, A squared, you know what AA stands for. I can't repeat it in the service, though. The first word is arrogant. Come up with the second word on your own. I think one of the idols that we have in this community is the idol of knowledge. And the idol of knowledge, well, it leads to arrogance, which causes us to look down on others we don't deem to be as intelligent as we are. Oh, you went to Michigan State. Okay, that's cute. This is a real university. Other idols we can see, though, how... They can lead to the injustices that are carried out in our world today. The idol of materialism. It almost always leads to greed, which undergirds the disparities that exist within our communities between the wealthy and those who live in poverty. The idols of power and control result in harassment, racism, and sexism. Our idols lie at the heart of all of our injustices. They lie at the heart of our identity, at the core of who we are. So much so that even if we were to see that we are bowing down to an idol, even if we were to recognize in our own lives that we are worshiping something before we worship God, well, we must admit that it's hard to break free from that idol when we realize. Because it's a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. And we are unable to break the attachment to those idols in our own power. And this is what had happened in Israel at the time of Micah. The people have become so entrenched. They have become so attached to their idols that God was going to bring severe judgment upon them. It was necessary for God to bring judgment upon them in order to tear their idols down before them. God had to bring this judgment in order so that he could reestablish them as a people devoted wholly unto him. We've talked about this last couple weeks. 
the themes that exist within the book of Micah. Themes of sin, judgment, hope. And the book of Micah is roughly 70% judgment and 30% hope of restoration. But knowing that here in chapter 1, it's really hard. You have to look really hard to find any source of hope here in this chapter that is talking about the coming judgment upon the Israelites. But it's there. The hope of rescue can be found in this passage, and it's found in the way that Micah is building his case here in this book. You see, Micah is presenting a court case here. He is presenting a court case where God is the judge, and the Israelites, that they are the defendants. And we see evidence of this court case throughout Micah chapter 1 here. Back to Micah 1, verse 2. Here we see the summons, the subpoena, if you will, that a legal trial is about to take place. Notice the language here. Hear you people. God will be a witness. Micah is saying, listen up, everyone. You are being summoned. You are about to be put on trial. In verse 4. Micah gives a preview of the judgment to come. A preview of what judgment will look like if there is indeed a guilty verdict. He says that the mountains will melt as God comes in judgment and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire. Verse 5 is the accusation leveled against both Samaria and Jerusalem. The statement of the crime against both Israel to the north and Judah to the south. The Israelites are being accused of worshiping idols in the high places that they created to do so. This is their idolatry, their sin, their transgression. And we talked about that last week. When we see these high places mentioned here, it is a reference to these sinners of idolatrous worship where the Israelites were coming to bow down to things that weren't really gods at all. This is their sin. This is their transgression, idolatry. And verse 6 is the sentence administered against the people. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. So the Israelites have been summoned. There's a picture of punishment. There is an accusation of the crime of idolatry, their transgression. And then there is a sentence for that idolatry. Now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever been a defendant in court. But if you ever have, if you ever will in the future whether you are just accused of a crime or you actually committed a crime, I hope that you have someone there to defend you. I hope that you have someone there, a lawyer, an advocate, someone to plead your case before the judge. Someone either to plead your innocence or someone there to hopefully go after a, a lesser punishment if you are indeed guilty. Well, this courtroom scene here is supposed to lead us to ask, who is going to be Israel's advocate? Who is going to come and plead or intercede on their behalf? Will anyone come forward? Will anyone come forward to rescue the Israelites from their plight? To deliver them from the judgment that awaits them if they are found guilty? And we know that they are indeed guilty. Who will rescue them? Who would rescue us if we were put on trial for our sin? For our idolatrous ways? Where is the hope of restoration here? Well, the story of Micah, it exists within a much larger story of the Bible. And when we read this book in light of the rest of Scripture, we realize that there is somebody who has come into the courtroom to advocate for us. Someone has come to our trial to intercede for us. The name Micah in Hebrew means, who is like Yahweh? Who is like God? So who is like God? 
Well, the answer is no one. Micah certainly wasn't like God. He wasn't going to be able to intercede on behalf of the people before a holy God. Who could ever stand up and intercede on our behalf before a perfect judge when our guilt is evident for all to see? Micah's name is supposed to drive us to admit that no one is like God. No one is capable of entering our trial and getting us free before the righteous judge of all creation. We are doomed in our guilt and in the judgment to come upon us. No one is like God. No one will stand up on our behalf except one. When all hope seems lost because of our impending judgment for sin, Jesus Christ enters the courtroom to advocate for us, to speak on our behalf. Who is like God? The answer is no one. Jesus Christ has come forward, and the reason he is able to intercede on our behalf is precisely because he isn't like God. Jesus Christ is God. In this passage, we read about the nakedness and shame that awaited the Israelite people in judgment. But it was Jesus Christ who had come to bear the shame of our judgment so that we could bear his righteousness. It was he who became tainted by our idolatry so that we could be rescued from our attachment to it and from the judgment we deserve because of it. Jesus Christ, God, he is the only one who can rescue us from our, from our idolatrous ways and break from us our attachment to them. Jesus Christ is the only one who can take the judgment for our sin upon himself so that we can be freed by the power of the gospel. Only Jesus can keep us from putting idols on the throne of our hearts, either in his place or alongside him. Jesus Christ is the only one that can satisfy our deepest longings. When our hearts long for Jesus above all else, every other thing, every other person in this world loses the ability to exercise power and control over us in a way that keeps us from being who we were meant to be in Jesus Christ. What is taking place in this unfolding story of Micah is a picture of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ is the power that will dismantle our appetites. For all other objects of our affection, both for now and forevermore. My hope is that as we go through this book of Micah, it will cause us to look within ourselves and look within our own hearts to see our own idolatrous ways. Particularly as it relates to living out our faith in relation to the world around us. I think a good question to ask as we read through this book, a book of judgment is how should we feel about what we're reading? How should we feel about the Israelites as they are going through this experience? How should we feel about the judgment that is coming upon them? Should we be happy? Should we feel sadness or have pity on them? Don't they deserve to be punished and feel the full weight of God's wrath for their sin? If we take that and expand it to our world today, doesn't the world around us deserve to be punished? To feel the full weight of God's wrath for their rebellious, idolatrous ways? Should we feel sorrow, sorrow for those around us who freely reject God and pursue their own objects of affection? Or should we feel a sense of peace, knowing that that all those around us who would oppose God will eventually get what they deserve. How we respond to such questions reveals our deepest attitudes toward those who stand in rebellion to God. How do we view those in our communities who worship idols? How are we to treat them and interact with them? Should we pray for God's judgment to fall upon them? Should we pray that God would judge them for their hardness of hearts as they stand opposed to his will? Should we pray for God's judgment to come upon them in this world so that perhaps they will be delivered from those idols and turn to the only one who can truly satisfy their souls? 
Is it all right to pray for God to have mercy upon them? Do we love those around us enough to experience sadness knowing that God will in his time bring judgment upon them all? Are we willing to intercede before God on their behalf knowing that we have had someone come in and intercede before the Father on our behalf? Do we express grief over those apart from Christ? Or do we put up walls between them and us so that we can be busy doing our thing? Do we put up walls so that we don't have to worry about what they're doing out there in the world around us? Do we put up walls between others and us so as to avoid the heartache and pain that comes with dealing with those who don't agree with us? Who stand as those opposed to us and to God? Do we put up barriers so that we can feel safe and secure in our own lives, all while there is a spiritual war raging in the hearts of those around us? Do we have compassion on those who will die and experience the fullness of God's wrath? And what will we do to show that compassion? Will we wait for them to come to us? Or will we go to the people and speak truth? Will we go to them and extend mercy, love, and kindness even when they aren't willing to extend that to us? Will we love them enough to do what Micah does here in this book? To speak truth into the midst of spiritual darkness, even in places where that truth might be rejected by most, if not all. What is God calling us to do in response to the darkness around us? What is he calling us to do to address the injustice that exists within our own communities? Well, we start by speaking to people. We start by investing ourselves into the lives of those around us. We start by going to them, building relationships with them, speaking truth into their lives as we construct these relationships. We are to go out and be around and be involved in the lives of people who do not know Jesus Christ. I think so often we get so busy in our lives that if we know people that don't know Christ, it's often by mistake. Or it's often just because they work in the same office as us. But we're not intentionally going out and building relationships with people for the purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus with them. That is what we are supposed to be doing. Intervening into people's lives so that we can give them hope. Speak hope into their darkness. That's what I encourage you to do as a church this year. Spend more time investing in the lives of people that don't know Christ than you do coming up to a church building. Go and be intentional in those relationships with the purpose that you are going to speak the truth of the gospel when the opportunities arise. We also need to intercede for people. We need to pray on their behalf that God will withhold his eternal judgment a while longer so that more can come. To know him. Pray that God would discipline people. In this world. To get them to turn from their idolatrous ways. So they don't have to bear God's eternal punishment. Continue to pray for lost family members. Neighbors, friends and co-workers. And I know that many of you are doing that. You're praying for those close to you. For them to come back into a relationship with the Lord. Or come to know him for the first time. Our responsibility is to go and speak to those around us. Be an advocate for them as their day in court before a holy God approaches ever near. Here in chapter 1, Micah is laying out some basic truths that affect us as believers today. One is that we all struggle with idolatry. There are things, there are people in our lives that we often allow to become more important than God himself. The other truth that we see here in Micah 1 is that because of that idolatry, judgment needs to come. 
We are so attached to our idols. We are so attached to those objects of our affection that we can't break free from them in our own power and our own strength. We can only do so in the power of Jesus Christ. And so we have a choice as believers today. As we examine our hearts, as we see the idols that we often place before God in our own hearts, we can do one of two things. We can seek to allow God to work in our hearts to help us in His power to tear those idols down, to put Him first and foremost. And as God does that, I promise you, it's often a painful thing. When you're so attached to something, when something is so... If that is removed from you, it can be a painful experience to go through. And when we have idols in our hearts, things that we are worshiping before God, it's a painful experience for those things to be removed from our lives. But the alternative is suffering as well. It's suffering the injustice, the consequences for our sin as we sink deeper and deeper into despair. As we allow idols to take over our hearts, to have a place of prominence in our lives. And as idols, as they grow in prominence in our lives, inevitably what comes is darkness, despair, sadness. Insecurity. Either way, it's a painful experience. But only one way is their hope, and that is through God, through His Son, Jesus Christ. This year, may we look at our own idols. May we examine what things we need to tear down. What things that we need to remove before God so that He can have His rightful place in our lives. And perhaps that is a thing, a person that you are devoted to. Perhaps it's a way of life. Perhaps it's some sort of tradition that you honor. What things do we need to set aside so that we can be who God needs us to be for those in the world around us? Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you and we thank you. That you do not just leave us to suffer in our sin, to be consumed by it. Through your spirit, you continually work on our hearts. Continually reveal the truth of your word to us and help us to see that all that we bow down to, all that we worship in this world is futile. It only leads to more pain and suffering. Father, we are grateful that in your judgment, in your discipline, you seek to create within us a people, a group that is more devoted to you, more wholly set apart for you, to live as those who are holy and distinct in this world. Father, my prayer today is that you would break us of our idols, that you would break us of those desires that we have, to give our hearts to things other than you. To give our hearts to things to others, people, things that, that compete with you. And Father, there's some good things in this world, some blessings that we have that we have turned into idols because we have put them on the throne of our hearts right alongside you. Help us to put you first and foremost. And Father, as we do, we understand that the only reason we are able to have a hope and a future is because of your action, of what you have done by sending us your advocate. Father, as we look to the world around us, as we see the darkness in the hearts of men and women all around us, may we look on them with compassion and love. May we remember how far we were from you and how far you went to bring us back to you. May we be willing to go to the same links to go through the same pain and suffering to proclaim the hope of restoration in your son Jesus Christ in our communities around us this very day. Father, we exist for a purpose, and it's to point people to your son Jesus Christ. Help us to do that this day. In Jesus' name, amen.